In his first television interview, he told our reporter Amelia Papadopoulos that he felt compelled to join after watching news reports. Seen here relaxing at home. Two weeks ago, Tim Locks lived in Surrey and ran his own construction business. He's now relocated to Iraq to fight against the so-called Islamic State. So you've sold your home, you gave up your career and pretty much all the comforts you had here in London to go out to Iraq. A lot of people will be asking why. It was the photos and the videos of, of the um, people on, on Mount Sinjar uh, last summer. I just thought, you know, this is, this is a ridiculous state of, of, of events where these people are being persecuted by a, by a group of heavily armed thugs, basically. We tracked him down via social media and spoke to him on Skype. Tim can't reveal too much about his location, so we can't show you video of him. But these photos, he says, are evidence of his new life. Although he's not religious, he's joined a group called Dwike Nashar. Little is known about this nationalistic Christian militia, though it's understood it's recruited two to three hundred members, mainly from the West. Though Tim himself has no formal military training, he says he feels safe. I'm surrounded by people that um, I feel comfortable with and enjoy being with. The local guys are fantastic. The other Westerners uh, that are here are fantastic. So I wouldn't say that I've made any particular sacrifices. I'm just in a different part of the world doing a different thing than I was. Tim, obviously your family must be very concerned for your safety and well-being, but have they been supportive of your decision to go out there? They are aware of what I'm doing. They're, they're aware of where I am and they support me 100%. They're obviously scared as any, any parents would be. The Home Office says it consistently advises against all travel to Syria and parts of Iraq. Anyone who does travel to those areas is putting themselves in considerable danger. It also says the public can help by donating to charities with relief operations in those conflict zones. BBC London has found evidence to suggest that steroid use is happening here in the capital's gyms. Amelia Papadopoulos reports. At the height of his career in the 90s, Greg Valentino had the world's biggest biceps. With a circumference of 28 inches, these were the result of hardcore steroid abuse. But it's not just bodybuilders using performance-enhancing drugs anymore. City worker Andy has taken steroids for two years. He buys them from a dealer at his local gym. I started taking them because I felt I couldn't get any bigger training naturally. It was the next step for me. There's immense pressure to look good. It's part of the culture we live in. Andy, do you know any other people that take them? Yes, I know quite a few, and they don't regret taking them either. We all want that big figure. One American academic says the pressure on young men to look good has increased over the years. Here, for example, is Luke Skywalker from, from Star Wars when the movie first came out in 1980. And here is the same Luke Skywalker when... The movie was reissued by the mid-1990s. Young men turning to steroids appears to be a growing trend in the capital. One Needle Exchange in Soho says it's seeing more steroid users than ever before. Definitely our numbers are increasing um, on a regular basis. I've been working with steroid users for about 16 years and when I first started working with them, um, guys were normally in their late 30s, a traditional bodybuilder. Now the average age is about 23. Anabolic steroids are Class C drugs. They can be injected or taken as tablets, and there are almost 100 different types. While it's illegal to sell or distribute them, using them isn't against the law, and they're not hard to get hold of. An online search for Buy Steroids London brings up more than half a million results. The Home Office estimates that 60,000 people in the UK used steroids last year, but the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence says the figure is likely to be three times that number. Because of the problem, the health watchdog advised gyms to provide sharp spins for the safe disposal of needles as part of new guidelines last year. We'd say that that's a really important thing to do. One of the recommendations in the guideline was very much around availability of sharp spins because the focus of the guideline is about reducing harm, reducing risk of infection. Easy Gym told us they've installed sharp spins in all of their gyms. Virgin Active, Fitness First and David Lloyd said some of their clubs also have them. All the gyms said they had a zero tolerance approach to steroids and the bins are a health and safety measure for diabetic members and the disposal of razors. However, BBC London has seen used syringes disposed of in several gyms around the capital. 
Steroids might enhance performance and make muscles grow bigger, faster, but there's a list of potential side effects from hair loss and acne to depression, liver and heart problems. Fast, reliable broadband is something that most people in the capital have become accustomed to, and for many of us, it's something we take for granted. But the residents here in Cowley Street in Stockwell just don't have that luxury. They say opening a web page can take up to three hours, and going on sites like YouTube or the BBC iPlayer is virtually impossible. And that's because this is London's slowest street for broadband. The downloading speed here is just 1.41 megabits per second. Now, that figure might not mean much, but if you consider that the national average is 22.8 megabits per second you can see how far behind this street is even more shocking is that it's 50 times slower than the fastest broadband area in the capital in Barnet which recorded 64.5 megabits per second this is one of the three storage units being searched today and as you can see officers have already seized hundreds of suspected stolen mobile phones and over £10,000 in cash. Well, the British Transport Police believe that many of these smartphones could have been stolen from passengers on London tubes and trains. They're then brought here, repackaged and sold abroad. While all laser surgeons must be qualified doctors, they aren't legally required to have any specialist qualifications. A lot of the time, consultations aren't carried out by doctors. One expert says that has to change. Patients are often seen initially by uh, an optometrist, not a doctor, and uh, these optometrists are trained to uh, assess people preoperatively, but then it's not the same thing as proper continuity of care. And I would like to see the high street industry sticking with corneal specialists, uh, people who are trained to a high level. The Care Quality Commission told us that they'll be looking into the findings in the WITCH report. Meanwhile, the Department of Health say they're working with the Royal College of Surgeons to tighten standards and training on laser eye surgery and improve the way patients are given information. And these ambulances could be used as treatment centres. And they've already been stocked with lots of vital medical equipment, as syringes, latex gloves and, of course, protective bodysuits. Because as soon as these vehicles arrive in Sierra Leone, they'll go straight to work. One by one, the vehicles are loaded onto a container that will be shipped from Tilbury to Freetown tomorrow morning. While their work in London might be done, in their new home, they will almost certainly be the difference between life and death. Amelia Papadopoulos, BBC London News. She also happens to be one of the most powerful women in English football. At the age of just 30, she's the CEO of Charlton Athletic Football Club. Katrin, you're, you're one of very few females in such high positions at football clubs. Do you think we need to see more of this? We bring something else to the table and I think that's also what football needs and especially if we want to also appeal to a female audience. I believe that women are a bit more better in, in keeping the budget. Any, any details of the fine itself? Well, we know that the maximum fine for this kind of offence is about £25,000. But again, the Premier League are not revealing exactly how much Crystal Palace have been asked to pay. And many people might argue that £25,000 really isn't that much for a Premier League club. But I think for Crystal Palace, this is much more about the huge blow to their reputation. So much punishment. So much pain. So much hunger. 96-year-old Robbie Clark never forgets the 21st of January. It was on this day 70 years ago that he began the longest walk of his life. As one of the 80,000 British prisoners of war forced to march more than 1,000 miles across a frozen Eastern Europe. It was uh, June the 21st, 1942, Midsummer's Day. I remember it well. That was the day Robbie was captured by the Nazis. He was held in a prison camp in Poland for three years until Hitler ordered all prisoners back to Germany. I called it the death march because he just used to march and march with guards on their side of you. Some of our old fellas were so weak they just fell. Robbie was liberated by American troops in April 1945. He documented his ordeal in this tiny diary. But even without it, the memories are still vivid. Amelia Papadopoulos, BBC London News.